people with best practices, emerging trends, and leading thinkers in stakeholder engagement through an array of distinctive online programs. Her experience includes a range of public, nonprofit, and private sector projects over the past 25 years, including more than a dozen years designing, facilitating, and implementing participatory processes for land use, transportation, and environmental projects. She is one of a small number of public engagement practitioners who are conversant in the use of both Web 2.0 social media and Web 3.0 immersive technologies. Uh, Beth also conducts public engagement research and engagement projects in the fields of transportation, land use, environment, and health at Virginia Tech, where she is a postdoctoral associate. Since 2008, she has chaired the American Planning Association's International Division, and she's played a leadership role in the creation of the division's two award-winning professional development programs. She's also one of the co-founders, and I really, really need to say the person that got this going, of our public engagement interest group. Our second speaker will be uh, Judith Dovers. She's pro project program manager for the community outreach for the comprehensive planning department at the Atlanta Regional Commission in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, she joined ARC in 1989 and is responsible for outreach, education, communication, and coordination with the public regarding planning activities, including the Regional Transportation Plan and Regional Land Development Plan. She serves on the Public Involvement Committee for the Transportation Research Board, the Editorial Board of the International Journal of Public Participation, the Advisory Board of the Forming APA Public Engagement Interest Group. She was one of the three or four of us that helped develop that. And she serves on the NCHRP panel on environmental justice best practices. Judith has also been involved in a variety of community services planning activities in such areas as ethnic diversity, community visioning, strategic planning, community health, human services planning, homelessness, river to corridor history, grandparents raising grandkids, and leadership programs. She has particular interest in how to expand audience participation in planning activities through social media visualization, and small group community discussions. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Beth Offenbacher to give our first presentation. Thanks so much, Chris and Jennifer. I'm really excited to be here today to talk about social media as part of engaging people in planning decisions and projects. Um, just really briefly, uh, some of the things I'm going to cover today in my talk, I'm going to talk about the context and the uses of social media and highlight some different examples that whether or not you're using social media, um, I hope will excite you to explore some new directions for how you can, can use it as part of your stakeholder engagement activities. I'm going to touch on the cost benefits and trade-offs uh, throughout my talk and, and I'll just spend a few minutes on that later on. And I'll wrap up by offering some key questions to think about as you consider uh, the range of things that you can do using social media in your engagement work. So just to, to touch on briefly, um, as you can see here from this list, there is an almost uh, Im impossible array of, of social media tools that we can use in our work today. I find it really hard to keep up with myself, and I really try to follow this, um, this part of, of technology. So I'm sure that many of you are using uh, some of these tools. Uh, a few of you may be curious and, and thinking about adapting them. But I'd like to start out before I get into some of the examples and, and ask uh, who among our group are, are, are using social media today as part of stakeholder engagement. So I, I think Jennifer has brought the poll up on the screen, so if you could take a minute to, uh, to register your response, um, that would be terrific. So we'll just pause here for a moment and, uh, and see what, uh, what folks' responses are. We've got about half the responses in so far, so we'll give everybody a few more seconds to go ahead and, and get their votes in, and then I will go ahead and, and close the poll in just a moment. Great. Thanks so much, Jen. Okay, we're going to go ahead and uh, close the poll. All right. 
Okay, and so here are the results of the poll. You can see that about a third of the respondents are not using social media right now. A quarter of them rarely use it. You have 13% who are your regular users and 27% who sometimes use social media. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Well, and those responses uh, are really interesting when we think about uh, how others, how we've heard that others are using social media. Um, one thing that I, I want to mention in preparing for this talk, I went out to, to check uh, recent data, and there really is not any kind of uh, national poll among planners that shows um, how they're using social media. So, uh, the snapshot that all of you provided today is a, a really interesting um, display for uh, kind of how people are, are currently using this technology or not as part of their planning work. Um, here's a study that certainly it's not representative, but it gives another snapshot. Um, it, it's from Virginia. It was conducted by Tom Sanchez's Technology for Planning class um, at Virginia Tech. And uh, they surveyed Virginia planning offices. They had about a 40% response rate, which is really fantastic. And interestingly enough, 27% uh, of those responses, just like our poll today, um, said that they were using social media as part of sharing planning information with the public. Um, and that 12% of respondents were not using technology at all. Uh, interestingly, the, uh, the study's authors um, reflected on what they saw as this low level of technology that's being used in Virginia, uh, and this emphasis here is, is mine. Um, they talked about uh, how GIS and Google Earth are really popular, but that social media and blogs and some other kinds of visualization, visualization tools really are underutilized. And they speculated on some of the reasons for that. Uh, it could be cost. Certainly, that's something that we're all facing today, uh, and various office policies. For example, some agencies still have firewall blocks that, um, <clears throat> that restrict people from uh, accessing social, social media sites like Facebook and other ones. That's starting to change, we're seeing, as more and more agencies realize that these tools are, are, great, um, are, are great ways to talk with stakeholders, uh, but some of those policies are still in place. Um, another point I want to draw out of this study, and you can certainly access it there at the, uh, at the link that's noted at the bottom of the page, is they found that about 80-some-odd uh, percent of people are using technology to prepare reports and presentations, which is really great. Um, but I really want to focus on the first two categories there, data collection and data analysis, because those are really um, the types of activities that involve stakeholder engagement. And as you can see here, 68% uh, of people, of the, that 27%, are using technology for data collection and 61% for analysis. Um, and what we're really talking about in, in applying social media for stakeholder engagement is finding ways to tap what's called the emergent expertise. We're looking at connecting with frontline stakeholders, with community leaders, uh, and with engaged customers, too, especially for um, public transit agencies that are looking for ways to, um, to provide information about uh, schedules and that type of thing to people who use their services. Um, one theme you're going to hear me talk a, a lot about today is the importance of knowing what your stakeholders are using and how they want to interact with you. That's really a, a key lesson, I think. And the Bay Area Rapid Transit um, uh, Agency is, I'd say, a leader in terms of public transit and engaging with their stakeholders and using social media. There are some others out there. TriMet is really good. Uh, MTA in New York. There are some others as well. But BART did this survey as part of updating their public participation plan this last year, and they asked stakeholders, they had about 1,000 respondents, uh, what are the best ways to present detailed material to you for a meeting? And I think it's really interesting that 43% of people said that they wanted to go online to look at material before a meeting. Now, what that means could be many things. It could be on a blog. It could be on a website. Um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But it shows that people have a desire to uh, go to te technology, the internet, 
as a way to facilitate learning more about planning decisions and projects. Uh, a second question, which I think is also really interesting, they also asked people, in addition to a meeting, how likely would you be to use the following to express your views on BART-related issues? And you can see here, uh, three of them listed there are technology-enabled, of course, email, as we know. But people had an interest in um, completing a survey online as part of providing data, again, going back to that data collection function, as well as um, participating in online discussions. So I thought this was a, a really great example of understanding again, what people are looking for as ways to support a more effective public participation. And BART uh, used that data as part of putting together their public participation plan this last year, and you can uh, access that on, on the internet. Um, they talked about uh, also using uh, their website to conduct surveys and polls, and that's something that they say they're going to be implementing. Um, I love BART as an example. They're really socially media savvy. As you can see down here in the right-hand corner, they've got all the icons, their Twitter uh, feed, uh, Facebook page, et cetera, et cetera. One thing that they've also talked about, which I think is really great about social media um, in particular, is they've talked about being able to make information available in multiple languages, which supports inclusivity. And knowing that diversity and inclusion is a goal of engagement, uh, one thing that I, I want to draw your attention to is the ability to use a variety of platforms to talk to people uh, in their language. So if you have a, a large proportion of Spanish speakers in your community, to have a Twitter feed that makes announcements about upcoming meetings in that language would be pretty easy to do. So uh, that's another great benefit of all these different social media channels. Um, I can't leave the BART example um, without citing their, uh, just their forward-thinking applications in terms of mobile options. And you can see here, um, they've got a, a, you know, a mobile website. You can get information by SMS, you know, text message on your phone. They have some third-party applications. Now, some of you may be saying, well, I'm a planning agency, and we really don't have a need for that type of thing. Uh, what I think is really cool about this uh, from the perspective of BART is they really see this as a way to develop long-term relationships as part of then bringing people in for specialized project consultation. So, um, you know, while this is something that may not be for everyone, uh, I think we're going to start to see more and more of um, at least the, the mobile-ready websites uh, as technology changes. And I'd like to, to just touch on that a little bit. Um, we're going to be doing a conference next month on mobile applications and games for engagement. And in my research, um, I, I just see more and more of this happening. This is an application that was developed. Uh, it's used by, by uh, Brisbane city government for people to send in uh, repairs, uh, you know, requests for things that need to be fixed. You can see the park bench example here. Uh, it's called Fix Vegas. I'm not sure why they call it Fix Vegas, but um, you know, Apple is really the big behemoth in the room when it comes to mobile technology. And what they do, uh, the other providers of, um, you know, cell phones uh, grab onto. And so we're starting to see uh, already uh, Android and some of these other um, cell phones that are out there are, are really kind of catching up with Apple. And so as these kinds of uh, cell phones that are more sophisticated, the mini computers Chris talked about, become um, just kind of uh, just the, the way cell phones are, more ubiquitous, we're going to see more and more of these apps. And I have to mention, um, I'm a member of the APA Technology Division, and uh, there was a great article in the newsletter this last time about how Delaware, Ohio, has created an application um, that people can use to report code violations. So this is really the coming wave um, uh, in, in many ways. Um, it is important, though, as you think about these different technologies, to keep an eye to kind of what are the national trends as well as uh, locally, as I've mentioned. Uh, here you can see six in ten Americans um, use wireless internet through uh, mobile devices. They're, they email, they uh, do instant messaging, and of course, uh, data shows uh, African Americans, 18 to 29 year olds, 
lead the way in, in using these um, cell phone data applications. Another study by Pew Internet, which is a great resource uh, if you're tracking some of these trends, shows that Latinos really are using um, uh, mobile phones to access the Internet a lot, and there's speculation that that's because of digital divide issues. So as you think about inclusion, you need to think about these larger issues. Um, and also, uh, as we think about data collection, um, consider the types of uses that people are, um, are using on cell phones. So taking a picture, for example, you're doing a visioning process, getting people to, uh, to do that could be a really great way to tap into a use that, again, people are, are already, already know how to do, or to send or receive text messages, comments on plans, or announcements about meetings. So uh, cell phones, um, I think, are a, a coming wave as part of the, the social media mix that uh, is going to just become um, more common. Um, I want to now dive into a couple of uh, other examples. Uh, here's a site, MontgomeryPlanning.org, part of the Ma Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. Um, what I love about this particular um, website is that it has a range of different things available. They have two blogs, um, and blogs are great for commenting and, and getting feedback, certainly, and there are ways that you can export those comments to be able to track that as part of your engagement. And they have a director's blog, you can kind of high level, you know, policies, other types of things. But they also have a project related blog called The Straight Line, which is, is also great. They have an event calendar, they have a little poll there, tell us how we're doing, and they have a Facebook page. Um, you know, I, I do want to pause for a minute and talk a little bit about Facebook. Um, Facebook is great. It's a free tool, and heaven knows we all like free things. But from an engagement perspective, it does have some drawbacks. Uh, one of the things about Facebook is that uh, there is not a way to export comments. So it's wonderful to post information or videos there, uh, that type of thing. You can do a chat in, in some ways. Um, through Facebook, there's some applications you can add to your page to enable that. But um, Facebook is one of the few applications out there that you cannot export comments. So all those posts to the page, love the plan, don't like the plan, change the plan. Um, if you want to have a staff member cut and paste those things, uh, it's pretty time consuming. Uh, the good news is there are some other applications out there uh, that can, uh, can be used to, to gather comments on plan and that, that will let you uh, export that kind of information. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Um, I do get a lot of questions about Twitter. Uh, Montgomery Planning has a Twitter account. I'm sure many of you also do. Um, but 37% uh, of people are using their phone to tweet. So we're starting to see some crossover there between traditional use of computers and the phone, as uh, we were talking about a few minutes ago. And interestingly, more women use Twitter than men. They tweet a little bit more than men. But Twitter trails Facebook. And if you have to decide where to spend your time, um, you know, that's, that's a factor to consider. 40% of people are on Facebook. Sometimes it makes sense to go where people are. Uh, then they don't have that curve of, of learning a whole new technology. Uh, and uh, place matters, too. If you're in some place like Seattle, Twitter is great. If you're in the middle of a Kansas um, small community, maybe Twitter is not the, the best uh, fit for you. It also trends to be somewhat uh, affluent in terms of the demographics. So um, just going into this, knowing all that is, is just good background, especially if you need to build a case for a city manager or someone else uh, within your agency to say, here's why we should be uh, using this technology or, or that technology. And here's an example, just one, there are many out there, of, of how an agency is using Twitter um, for announcements. This is Park County, Colorado. Um, another thing, Twitter, there are some applications where you can export uh, posts that you receive. Um, uh, one, I think, is called TweetVet. There are a handful of them out there. But the drawback of Twitter is it's 140 characters. So if people have a lot to say, you know, <laughs> to truncate what you what you want to offer in terms of input on something um, is kind of difficult. Uh, there is 
certainly the a ton of tools out there that can analyze um, in terms of the types of comments received and you know who's following you and all those types of things on Twitter. There's also that that um, that capability with Facebook uh, as well. So that is one benefit in terms of uh, getting a sense of how popular your page is or your, your Twitter feed. Um, one thing I, I want to draw on to is um, another approach to social media. Everybody's probably pretty familiar with Wikipedia. This is a wiki that was used for a planning project. Very cool. It's um, it's a more non-traditional approach, I think, um, where people collaborated together just like you do on Wikipedia on editing and putting together this plan. Um, again, it's not uh, an approach that a lot of agency use, agencies use, but it is a neat way um, to, uh, to engage with people uh, using social media. And this is Melbourne, Australia. Um, sometimes people will say to me, wow, well, that's all well and good, but there's just too many things to choose from, and we're a small agency, we don't have the, the staff to, you know, do all these social media projects. And I like to say, you know, simple can always be, uh, be a good way to go. Uh, this is an example from Los Angeles, their bicycle plan update this last year. They did a webinar. You can do a PowerPoint, you can do a webinar. Um, and they had, um, let's see, they had over 100 people RSVP. They had a, there's, you know, about a 50% drop off generally on, on free programs. Uh, we see that as well with some of the free programs that we offer in public decisions. But it isn't a way that you can expand your audience. Uh, so sometimes you can only, you know, have time and, and effort, uh, money to do one thing. It's okay to pick just one of these things and, uh, and use that for engaging people. Here's another example from Texas uh, where they use podcasts to update people about a project. Uh, so you could subscribe to that or you could uh, read the transcript. So if you weren't into that whole iTunes thing, uh, you know, there's another way to access um, the report. Um, you know, I, I want to go back to my comments a few minutes ago about being able to export comments because that's really important. You need to be able to often show and analyze that data as part of uh, part of your engagement effort. Uh, this is a site. There are many of them, uh, many of these tools available. This is called Engagement HQ. It's by a group out of Australia called Bang the Table. Um, there are a lot of other tools that you could look at if you go to the website participatedb, like database.com. There are a range of them there. I really like this one. Um, it's, it's used a lot in Australia. It's starting to be used here. Austin's been using it because um, it allows a lot of rich media, videos, pictures, you know, a whole range of things. Another thing I like about this site is if you want to do a closed engagement, you've got an advisory group, you can just close it to them and have them participate. So it's a, a really nice application. Um, and here's just a, a picture of, of kind of what the discussion looks like. People can agree, disagree, they can report something as off comment. Um, and it has a report, reporting capability that uh, quantitatively and qualitatively you can uh, review what was posted and you know percentage of people agreeing and all that type of thing. So it's got a really nice robust back end and they moderate comments for you. So there are some other ones out there that's just one. Um, but you need to really think through all of these different aspects um, for what you need when you go about selecting a, um, a social media tool. Um, I, I can't uh, give this talk without mentioning one of the hottest topics of the last year, which is crowdsourcing. Um, uh, this is a project from Utah that was around designing a bus stop. It's, uh, it's a custom design in that um, it was built specifically for this project, and it's pretty cool. It's got an ability to submit a design. You can rate a design. There's a discussion form, too. Um, there are some off-the-shelf uh, applications out there. User voice is a, a, a big one these days. There are a lot of other ones. Um, but uh, one point I want to draw out here, there are some questions about what really is crowdsourcing. Does there have to be voting for it to be crowdsourcing? Does a survey count as crowdsourcing? Uh, what about qualitative comments? If you go through that and get a sense of, 
you know, some themes that that count as crowdsourcing. And so, you know, it's kind of a great big buzzword right now, um, but you need to really think through some of those, those questions as you, you consider, um, you know, using a, a crowdsourcing approach to engagement. There's a really great article by Rob Goodspeed in this month's, um, the most recent technology newsletter from the, tech, um, from the APA Technology Division that I would draw your attention to. Um, one other point I'll mention that's really important going back to this building the long-term relationship and you know, the project to periodic engagement um, with stakeholders as part of that is you need to be really upfront with people. Um, how are you going to use the information that you receive from them through crowdsourcing? Are you going to go with what the crowd says? You know, if they vote 52 votes, they like this, and 25 against, you're going to go with what the crowd says? Or are you going to take that under advisement as part of a larger decision-making structure. So, Beth, um, I'm gonna, that's, that's, Beth, I'm just going to pause you for a second because the term crowdsourcing oh, sure. is new to a lot of the folks that are participating in today's webcast. Can you just step back and explain simple language, what is crowdsourcing um, for those who aren't familiar? Oh, sure, sure. Great, Jennifer. I, in fact, I do get into, I know what it means, uh, but others may not. Crowdsourcing is really um, uh, a movement in this last year where you can get a sense of really what are the preferences of a group. Um, so it could be around a particular design or, um, uh, you know, funding options or, uh, you know, different choices that you would present to people and say, you know, tell us where if you were going to, uh, we give you um, a certain amount of, of money or a certain number of votes where would you allocate those things so we can consider that as, as part of making decisions? And so a lot of these crowdsourcing applications will ask people to, uh, to divvy those things up or to, to vote uh, on particular options. Um, it it kind of gives a more, more quantitative perspective as compared to submitting a comment in writing, you know, I think this, and here's why I like this project, and, and things of that nature. So um, does that help? Well, then uh, let me move on a little bit then. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about costs and benefits and trade-offs. I've touched on that uh, throughout my slides, but it would be really great to hear from everybody. If you could just type in the chat window um, what you see as the top challenge uh, you face in using social media. And if you're not currently using so social media, what is the top challenge to starting to use social media that you see? And we'll just pause for a minute and, and uh, pardon, get a sense of, of, uh, of folks' reactions to that question. Okay, Beth, while uh, folks are pausing, uh, posting comments, which they are vigorously doing, can you give one or two other examples of crowdsourcing? Um, we've gotten several questions from folks um, asking for other types of applications. So you mentioned Next Stop Design. Do you have another example you might point to? Oh, gosh, let's see. Off the top of my head, um, <laughs> Do you want me to jump in and help you there? Yeah, if you would. Um, just off the top of my head, I can't think of, I, there are tons of them out there, but I'm just drawing a blank. Right. So the White House has been uh, really big on trying to promote the use of this particular tool, crowdsourcing, and so they have uh, their Office of Science and Technology was soliciting ideas about where should science and technology research be going. Um, HUD recently used this as part of setting priorities that members of the public could come in and uh, give their input on what ideas that they think uh, might be most appropriate. Uh, there's an effort right now in, I believe it's Lincoln, Nebraska, and they are using this as part of their comprehensive plan to look at the various growth scenarios and get uh, crowdsourced input on those uh, growth scenarios. Okay, Beth, I have uh, some folks that have been typing in their, um, their comments here, so I'm just going to read off a few of these, and you can pick and choose what you want to address. So Landon yeah. says, uh, the time to update. That's a, a big challenge. Uh, George mm. says, working with leadership to develop a plan for a consistent voice. Um, Jim uh, says, yes, the time commitment as well. Uh, Jasmine says, the staff time required. Uh, resistance by public sector clients from Ann. Um, mm. It looks like Kathy and several others, uh, upper level staff uh, challenges. Um, 
Wow. Well, uh, so those are all, uh, gosh, those are all challenges I think that uh, we've all encountered in, in, uh, in different projects. And, and it's certainly not surprising as we think about um, this is something that's a little bit new for people and, you know, those are certainly legitimate concerns. Um, and to the, the staff time, absolutely, that is one that needs to be considered. Even if you use some of the free tools, uh, you still have to have somebody who's monitoring that Twitter feed or whatever it is. So that's something that really needs to be considered. And so, you know, like I was saying, sometimes just starting small with one particular tool uh, where, that you know people find pretty popular in your community is sometimes the way to go. Um, the sustainability over time is, is something as well, um, and certainly that's that's something that needs to be communicated to leadership. Uh, you can't just start that Facebook page and then you know expect it to just kind of maintain itself. Um, it should really be thought about as part of your larger social media and engagement strategy. So how are you going to use that to, to cultivate that relationship? Um, another point: um, the, the keeping pace. Um, I don't think any of us would have expected that uh, Facebook was going to overtake MySpace, but it happened. And so uh, while you're working on whatever that tool is that you found to be a good match for your community, you also have to be aware of where are people going um, so that you don't get yourself in that, that kind of a situation when you're using a technology that really um, you know, has been passed by. And the sunshine law piece of that, um, certainly talking with upper level staff, there's been a lot of discussion lately in FOIA forums. I'm part of a FOIA chat that uh, that happens regularly. That's been something, especially following the Supreme Court ruling in recent years about social media, and um, it was a, a case that involved a BlackBerry with a, a, a staff member. Um, what's accessible and what's not. Uh, different states have different laws on that, so you should definitely check with your legal counsel so that you're compliant. Um, you know, a couple of other things uh, on the community side, it can really enhance your reach. I think I've touched on that a little bit, and the diversity inclusion aspect and inclusion aspect is, is really great um, as well. Uh, one thing I didn't talk about in, in my comments today, but Second Life is a place that, for example, people with disabilities go, uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, resources there for them. And so if you're trying to reach out to people with disabilities in your community, it's, it's a great place to go, go to um, for talking with them. So, you know, uh, thinking very broadly about these kinds of things and ways that you can uh, meet people where they're at is, is really important. Uh, there is a learning curve for some of these technologies as well, and you need to be prepared to help people. Um, this is one reason why it's good to go where people already are because then you don't have to, to help them learn how to, to access that technology. Um, and then on the, the side of the tool, I've talked uh, a little bit about some of the functionality and the reporting issues that you really need to, to think through carefully so you know what you're getting into and that the, the tool can really do what you need for it to do. So I'll, I'll round with just touching on the three key points. Uh, first of all, you need to know the technology. Again, what are its limitations and weaknesses? What are its strengths and opportunities? And I really encourage people, if you're going to start using social media, keep an eye to how other people are using it successfully and unsuccessfully, and go outside of um, the profession. I've gotten some great examples from uh, the health sector and uh, you know, other um, professional practice areas that I've adapted, and uh, you know, it's it's always valuable to uh, to borrow ideas like that. Um, know what you're trying to accomplish with that project. It's really easy with all these cool new new tools coming out. You get all excited. Wow, it can do this. Um, but don't get sucked into that. You need to go in with your criteria. What do you need the technology to do, and then look for the tool that matches that. Um, the, the harvesting of the information, I can't emphasize that enough. Nobody wants to be cutting and pasting posts on Facebook. Um, so think about that piece. And how are you going to know if that technology has been successful? If you're, you've got to do performance reporting in your agency, you need to be able to, to talk about, hey, this was a good investment of our time. And then thinking overall about your, your agency strategic plan. 
you got to think long term about engaging people in support of the mission. Um, and last of all, I've, I've emphasized this several times, um, how are people using the technology? Uh, if it's new, how can you help them effectively use it? And, um, and, and finally, uh, social media is not a, uh, a be-all, end-all. I think uh, it's really a complement to your other approaches. You'll always have public meetings and uh, all these other ways that you've always engaged with people. It's just a, a, a way to, to really enhance and expand on, on ways that you involve people in your, in your decision. And I can't, um, I can't conclude without just putting in a plug for the, uh, the Ning site that, that Chris mentioned earlier. We have about 100 people or so part of that group. So really, I encourage you to, to get involved with that. Um, and here is uh, how you can reach me through a variety of social media platforms, as well as traditionally. Um, you're welcome to join our free circle club that we send out email announcements about our programs. We have a lot of free things, as well as low cost things. Um, so connect with us, and uh, love to have you participate in our program. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to Jennifer and Chris. Okay, wonderful. Thanks so much, Beth. So I, I will just mention for folks that we uh, do have a Twitter feed that is running. So if you go to Twitter and search for hashtag APA social media, I'm posting many of the links that uh, Beth has been talking about, and we'll do the same thing uh, with Judy's presentation. So if you want more information about the various uh, posts that have been uh, talked about throughout today's presentation, check us out on Twitter at APA social media. All right. Right. With that, Chris, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, I have already uh, talked about Judy Dovers and what she does with the Atlanta Regional Commission, so I'm just going to uh, ask her to uh, start her presentation, and then I'll come in at the very end. Okay, great. Uh, Judy, I see your presentation's up, so you're ready to go. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm really happy to share the things that I know, but I'll have to tell you that the Public Decisions website is a godsend. It has so much there to, to really inform. So Beth does a superior job in putting all that together and disseminating it out. So it's, it's really, really recommended to you. So it's my hope today that while I share some of my thoughts about social media with you, that um, each of you can share your thoughts with us. Uh, you each have a whole other set of experiences and insight, whether it's just at the beginning or at the, at the um, more advanced level. Um, it can be a really rich discussion at the end of this, uh, this webinar if, if you can add your thoughts, which you probably are doing right now. I can't see what, what's happening. Um, what I'm going to do today is tell you a little bit about where I work and what we've been doing in social media. Uh, share with you some of the cool applications that I have come across, and end the presentation with some so what thoughts. Um, I'm coming to this presentation from the point of view of a public agency practitioner. Uh, we're on the path of discovery of social media, but a lot of the concerns that you all uh, expressed just a minute ago, those are concerns that we have as well. And I can tell you what we have done with it and, and, what, um, and, and some of the questions that we ask ourselves every day. So at the end, I, I also have some more uh, uh, resources that you can look at as well. So to begin, um, the Atlanta Regional Commission is where I work. Um, our board is composed, and this is very critical to social media, our board is composed of county commission chairs and mayors of cities and some citizen members. Um, within ARC, we are a MPO, a metropolitan planning organization that focuses on transportation planning, and a regional, trans a regional planning commission which focuses on land use planning in addition to many others. And you can see the screenshots here from our website um, as to all of the different parts of ARC. And our social media um, uh, is touching on each one of those. Um, for the purposes of today, though, I'll um, be um, concentrating mostly from the point of view of community outreach and transportation and land use planning. Um, our planning territory is very defined. It's 18 counties in the metropolitan Atlanta area for transportation planning. That's 5 million people. 
Um, and with that 5 million people, we are federally and by state law responsible for sharing our plans with the, with the region's people and getting their input. It's all well and good to hear from others in other parts of the country or the world, but input from our region is really uppermost in, in, our, in our work. So right now we're currently coming to the end of a three-year planning process called Plan 2040. It's our long-range land use and transportation plan, and it's due to be adopted this summer. For this plan and the plans that contribute to it, which are the jurisdictional plans, modal plans, corridor plans, we base our outreach on conversations with the leadership of the region, decision makers, those who are impacted by the plans, and those who have an interest. That's that's a lot of people, um, but it is defined geographically by our planning boundaries. And at the end of the day, decisions uh, of these public affairs or for these public affairs are made by a rather small group of people. So to start off, um, I have a few charts as well. Um, to begin the discussion of social media, uh, we recognized at ARC that in, in 2008 that social media was important. And this graph uh, from eMarketer shows, um, uh, is talking about social networking site utilization from 2005 to 2010. And like Beth was showing you, um, 18 to 29 year olds uh, went from 16% utilization in 2005 to 86% in 2010. 65 and older, older, 5% uh, to 26%, but the largest increase was the 50 to 64-year-old category, and that was 7 to 47%. Um, social media is really dynamic, and certainly it's cost-effective. Both hardware and software are evolving uh, literally before our eyes, but I'm not totally convinced that its applicability is unlimited. But it is impactful, and people think that. Uh, another table from the Pew Research Center's Internet and American Life Project shows that people think that uh, the influence of the Internet on the ability of groups uh, to impact society in a major way, that's 15% of the people that responded. 59% also said that there's a major impact in organizing activities, and 49% there was a major impact in impacting local communities. So it shows people are pretty positive about what the internet can do. But it's also true that in order for these things to happen, those groups would need to be specifically active already and know how to engage as a community before applying social media. At least that's my point of view. Social media is, is a great convener um, for controversial happenings for sure. And tech savviness remains a barrier, but it's breaking down all the time. Mobile technology is more and more user friendly, and it's becoming, and more of us are becoming mobile. But mobile applications for planning, is, uh, they do not support in-depth understanding or analysis. So getting back to ARC for a minute, um, in 2009, we decided to to kind of tread gingerly towards this new environment. We asked a consultant, a Concept Hub, to suggest a strategy framework for us. And this is the components of that strategy in, in front of you. What did we really need to understand before we ventured out? It seems so obvious now that uh, what Concept Hub suggested at the time. But at that time, all we saw was the gee whiz stuff and the amazing connection we could get with little expenditure and, oh, if it would be a detriment to our work and our, and our profile if we didn't jump right in. But we were given a methodical communication strategy that dealt a lot with who was our audience and what did we really want to do. Those were and are still the most important aspects of using social media. Our, our audience really is the finite metropolitan Atlanta area. We do want meaningful and useful feedback uh, from, from the community, but we, we have to define it in certain uh, very focused geographic terms. So let me show you a little bit about what we've done. Facebook, of course. Um, we have a Facebook page for the whole agency. Um, our fans are multicultural. They're evenly split between men and women. The largest age group is 25 to 44. They, they really help us reach an audience that we might not have gotten to otherwise. But it is part of a complete communication strategy. 
And it's at the uh, ARC Facebook page that you see here is in addition to several other Facebook pages we have for um, our activities in RideSmart, our, our transportation demand management activity, city connections with our governmental services division, age-wise connections with our aging division, and model ARC, which is our high school program. All of these sites communicate with their fans. Uh, we have a total of 1,320 fans. Uh, we get feedback from them. We respond to them. Uh, we get negative comments. We uh, let that happen unless it's just uh, a little bit uh, it's not offensive. Uh, if it is offensive, we don't put it out. Um, but on the other hand, we find that Facebook pages for individual products, projects like a quarter study may be a little overkill because they really just put people back to the website itself. And um, if, if the project is controversial, of course, that's, that's one thing. But um, it takes a lot of effort and time to update a Facebook page, especially if you're a consultant and, you, and, and this is something that's part of your contract. Uh, Facebook is good to introduce thoughts, but it's hard to have a conversation for any length of time. Um, we have two blogs that we, these are, these took the place of newsletters that our land use and our transportation planning divisions had. Uh, we have these, these two blogs that are uh, sent out through uh, WordPress. Um, we like them very much. Uh, there's not a lot of blogging activity. It's more of a dissemination of information. But people do search on that from the Google sites. They do. Uh, they can get information very quickly through the, the search terms. Um, so, and we can get stats that are very helpful to us. So we like this, but it's, um, it's really not a blog as such. What we have done um, for our, our long-range plan, the Plan 2040, is introduce something into our outreach strategy. Um, in addition to stakeholder meetings and community face-to-face -face forums, uh, interviews, briefings, workshops, media outreach, speaking engagements, we've put together uh, online public meetings. And these incorporate all that are what our standard public meetings would have. There is a video about the process, an audio about how the online public, me pu public meeting works, a video PowerPoint with audio of the presentation, a survey to respond to, resources and backup material and archives of previous information collected. We utilize Vimeo, SurveyMonkey, SlideShare, and the services of our in-house videographer. Um, during 2010, we had four of these. They were alive for one to two months at a time. And we intend to do two more before the plan is um, hopefully adopted this summer. We've had about 1,400 visits to the site for this particular online public meeting site and about 200 responses to our uh, surveys. And what you see in the screen is um, the, the card that we sent out, uh, an e-card inviting people to come to the meeting, um, and some of our resources. It's not very clear uh, what those are, but we have quick guides that people can get to different parts of the um, planning effort. In addition, we utilized Flickr uh, when we ran a photo contest in 2009 for our visioning effort called uh, 50 Forward. One of the key goals of 50 Forward was to have a public conversation to envision Atlanta 50 years in the future. It was open to all the residents of Atlanta and uh, the Atlanta region, and it was our first ever time doing a photography contest. We called it Framing the Future, and we got lots of uh, of uh, uh, phot photography from every possible um, skill level. We stole the idea from Chicago MPO, and they really helped us when we were initially planning this. Now, to blog or to not blog, and tweet or not tweet, um, like I said, ARC blogs to a very limited extent through the two, uh, the Transportation Spotlight and Land Matters. Uh, but there really is not very much uh, discussion or conversation. Um, there is a, um, a PR expert, Ben Brown, that recommends something that I think is it came right from our, um, it, it, it mimicked exactly what our strategy uh, said from, our, from the social media point of view. If there's a hot political climate, which sometimes it is where, where we are, that surrounds the plan, perhaps it's better to not have your own blog if you're a public agency. Um, instead, do some homework to 
seek out the most influential bloggers in the community and plug into their activity. Um, our information center at ARC sends our staff a post every day with the latest blog entries in the areas that <clears throat> we are working in, along with newspaper and magazine articles of interest. And our planners keep track of blogs as well. And so if we see something that is not right or factually um, inaccurate, then we can plug into that blog right then and, and give them better information. Um, ben Brown suggests that you treat blogs as you would the press. You, you build a relationship based on respect and transparency, and you focus on building the relationships. So it's a great way to uh, relay factual information and give a fair view of the project. Uh, Twitter, we don't do. Um, we think Twitter is really good for sharing breaking in, uh, news and information like state DOTs and transit agencies, and it's good for small defined groups. Uh, one consultant told me that Twittering was great for a core group. Uh, it's hard to get followers, um, any kind of large group of followers, but when you have a core group, um, you can really correspond with them pretty pretty nicely. And an example of that was when they went on a tour. They were able to tweet along the way and upload photographs that they took. And, and it, it was very effective. Um, Twitter is really good when there is something to say of immediacy. And you don't have to post all the time like uh, you, you would with Facebook. But there are other things that are wonderful, some cool sites that I like very much. And uh, for instance, um, all our ideas. It's very much uh, like the crowdsourcing you talked about earlier. You share ideas and you rate them. It enables groups to, to collect and prioritize ideas in a transparent way. And, um, and it's like a suggestion box that people can vote on and upload new ideas. Um, Lens on Atlanta is a project of our public broadcasting uh, station in Atlanta. It's a family of websites. Uh, one is focusing on civic engagement. Um, it is a, called Public Square. It enables you to connect and collaborate with residents and with local institutions. ARC is a partner with this. You build a profile and you search for issues that you can care about. And uh, there's the education piece that's called the, net, the Forum Network within Lens on Atlanta. And that features thousands of lectures to better understand the community. Um, our Plan 2040 Neighborhood Forums are featured there. And then there's Atlanta Planet, which is an online guide to the arts and cultural events of the, the, uh, the region. Tell a town hall meeting is something that is, is really interesting. Um, this is where thousands of constituents of a public official can receive a call inviting them to participate in this town hall meeting. And on a specific date, the uh, same constituents will receive a second phone call allowing them to speak to the public officials. These meetings allow the public officials to um, connect actually with just a single phone call using the autom automated dialing system. And uh, the listeners can ask questions and instant polls can be conducted with the press of a button. Some of our local officials have used this. The American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials has a Facebook page that is really asking for ideas about the um, new transportation legislation that Congress is expected to act on. Uh, it, it's on their Facebook page. They have a, a question, now it's your chance to tell Congress what's needed. Uh, comment and share your ideas and post your video. And you can get um, onto their site and then there's a transportationtv.org video that explains more about uh, what you can do there. And this last slide of good ways to participate, um, the word participatory communication is one I'm hearing more and more of. I, I like it. It's, it's a way to, uh, you know, that sometimes there's a, a disconnect between public relations and uh, public participation. And to me, this, this marries the two very nicely. It's, it's a balanced way of participation. It's a two-way flow of conversation. So um, in that respect, um, I like the, the mashups that we have here. And mashups are um, where you you in, include different technologies and, and different um, uh, information tools into one place. Uh, like the Broward MPO, it has an interactive bike route planning map. And it's a planning tool for bicyclists. And through a Google map, it asks people to, you can pick your route, uh, which is the least traffic, uh, which, has, which is the shortest route, which is the fastest route. Uh, it's called Find Your Path. Um, the tutorial video is really cool on this one. It's, it's, it's so um, 
low key. It's like someone is sitting next to you and teaching you how to use the map. Um, it's asking you to find the ice cream store um, near you and out pups the um, out pups the ice cream stores and and uh, and you can um, create a path that goes to that store on that map. There's another mashup, the city of Centennial, Colorado has done a, a master transportation plan and on the pins, the, the uh, pin heads, you can click on that and give your very specific project uh, uh, comments and this is really terrific feedback to the planning process. Uh, Miami Dade has been doing these public service announcement contests for a lot of years. They're on the eighth one now. Uh, the focus this year is to inform is for the people who are entering the contest to um, put together a video that informs citizens about the benefits of the Miami Dade Transit Bike and, and Ride Program, and um, and you can see all those videos on their site. and uh, And the winning PSA goes out. Um, broad and wide everywhere. The Give a Minute in Chicago um, is, Chicago is, has a lot of good uh, outreach going on and this particular one is, there's several Give a Minutes, but this one in Chicago is asking, uh, what would encourage you to walk, bike, or take CTA more often as a transit agency? Um, it ran for two months in 2010 and is really seen as a new model for citizen participation. Uh, you share your ideas with uh, on how to make Chicago an easier place to get around without owning a car and connect those ideas with the community leaders that they have identified. And um, and people can use, uh, they can text their ideas, they can post them to the website. So um, it's, it's very interactive. So <clears throat> what does this all mean? Um, I just gave you a very small selection of many possibilities out there. It shows, though, that we can really disseminate information. We can consider information as we never have been able to before. But I think we must step back and wonder what it all means. Um, the public has as much information as they want at their fingertips. Um, but how are they going to analyze and consider, and consider this information? Are they, are they really on the web to get together uh, with other people socially? Or are they really trying to understand the information? And is the information of, of a way that they can actually understand it? Is, what is the filter of that information? Um, will they be able to get uh, clarity in real time uh, that you can, you can do when you're forming relationship, relationships with uh, planners and, and officials? Um, will the public be able to trust the information that they see? Will the public officials be able to trust the information that is coming back to them via blogs and feedback boxes? And will they listen? Uh, will the wonderful information that comes from all these great campaigns to get on the ground uh, anecdotal input from the real people, is that meaningful? Is, is, it, is it going to make a difference in the end? ARC wants to know what uh, residents of the 18 county region think. Uh, they want to get that feedback from that 18 county. So should they go to a scientific survey to make sure it's coming from the people in the 18 counties and not somebody across the, the world? I don't have a lot of answers on this. I would love to hear what you all think. I'm not convinced that we have found the magic solution to public participation through social media, but in terms of what it was like before, um, I've been around a long time. This is amazing stuff that's happening right now. But I think we have to be very careful about what we think about the information and how we use it. So um, the questions uh, that I have um, are, what methodology really gives the most exposure uh, in social media uh, for your particular need? What makes for the most deliberative decision or discussion? Um, I would argue that that is one of the most critical parts of this. Um, what gives the most clarity in what the public really thinks? How will the decision maker trust the results? And what can influence that decision maker the most? And how can this be measured? Uh, that's also very important. That's what our leadership asked us constantly when we were going through the, the strategy. So I think in every case, um, there's a lot more than one answer. And the last slide I have today is just to give you some resources. 
uh, in addition to Beth's public, public decisions website, of course. Um, the public agenda, um, promise, promising practices in online engagement is a really good um, uh, paper. It reviews games and deliberation, uh, reviews allowing citizens to set priorities, using citizens as fact finders, merging online and face-to-face -face engagement, um, allowing experts and citizens to collaborate, and connecting neighbors. It has a lot of discussion about all of these um, tech not techniques that you can use. And of course, the National Co uh, Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation, they always have good good information. Um, the compendium uh, that's here, it's a compendium of the best of the best resources. Um, I really encourage you to download that. And interesting, the uh, Orange County Transportation Authority has a wonderful um, a small guide that shares their thoughts and experiences in using social media, um, using Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and giving their top Twitter tips and uh, the social media uh, road rules for engagement. So that's pretty cool. And uh, Jennifer, I think that's it for me. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Judy. Um, you gave us a, a lot of great information. Um, we actually have a series of questions that have come in specifically to you about your case studies. So I think we should start with questions there. And then in a few minutes, we can open it up for broader panel participation for some of the bigger picture questions related to social media. So one of the first questions that uh, we got from Kirby wants to uh, know, can you tell us how your staff is set up, who and of what skills uh, do you have to do this extensive kind of social media program, and how much funding or staff time went into this program? Um, which one is he talking about? I, I will try to, um, for the online public meetings, um, we have uh, our senior staff are the ones that give the presentations. And our communication staff, we have a videographer that does all the taping. Uh, and he uh, is, um, is on staff. And we have a communication specialist for transportation and land use planning. And he helps us with the communication. Uh, our communication staff is four people. Um, and they take turns uh, posting to Facebook. Um, the community outreach staff is me, so um, that's all there is for us. Um, and uh, that's about it. We, we have about 150 people working at ARC, and I have to say that they get all enlisted at one time or another to do something. Uh, the Transportation Spotlight and the Land Matters blogs are each staffed by a, a, a planner within one land use and one transportation. Okay, great. Um, how do you deal with inappropriate comments that are posted, especially when they come in over the weekends um, or, or when they stay out there for extended periods of time? Have you, have you had an issue with that? No. Um, the, the comments that come in that are inappropriate, I haven't seen. Um, they, if they come in uh, through Facebook, um, then our communication staff handles that. And they handle it by giving that comment to uh, the appropriate um, expert of that particular comment, the expert, the uh, knowledge expert of that particular comment. And, uh, and they, they send something back that is um, pretty even-handed. And, uh, and you know, it, positive. Um, if if a comment is totally off the wall, then um, there has been one that we received that I just let go because it was it didn't make any sense at all. But we very very rarely get anything that this this uh, offensive. And kind of along the same lines, um, Charles wants to know what about those who are getting organized. Um, in negative opposition to the planning process or program at hand. Has this been an issue for you that you had to guard against this uh, negative or opposition? So far not. Um, what we try to do is, is um, it's going to be different this time because social media is much more organized now in terms of blogs. And uh, we have not had any problem with our planning process so far. Uh, what will be interesting, though, is we are about to look at a, a sales tax referendum for transportation uh, in a couple of years. And um, there is a, a big movement right now um, that is going to be um, structured both for and against that in, in, a, in the blogosphere. So that will be uh, interesting to see 
how that that um, goes about. But the people that um, mount uh, opposition, um, they come to our uh, they come to us directly most of the time. Uh, they they come to our public meetings, um, and uh, and we try to talk with them individually. That's another part of our outreach effort. It's really small group meetings. Uh, that's something that I prefer over social media, actually, is really the small group discussions, where you can have a more reasoned um, analysis of, of, of the situation. OK, great. We've got, we're going to take one more question related to what you've presented specifically, and then we'll start our broader questions. So given that you're a government agency and there's a hot political uh, subject, what is your success in blogging um, that can be open for debate? So what is it that you're doing to try to engage in, in hot political subjects, and how do you manage that? That's from Frank. If, if, as far as blogging, I don't think that we are at that point. Um, anything that is a hot political item, uh, our our um, strategy is to make it a reasoned um, argument for what we are putting into the plan, and but listening to what people have to say and see if there's anything that we could we could use. Um, I, I think it needs to be a, a, a conversation uh, and a conversation that's 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 even tempered. So um, so far we have not had that. That happened with Plan 2040. It's been we have been. Um, I think we had 250 meetings this last year. So and it was every part of the community. So we've been really trying to get out there and talk individually to people as well as having the the online stuff. Okay, great. I'm going to go ahead and add Chris and Beth to our conversation, and then you all can decide who wants to respond to some of these questions. So. FOIA was talked about briefly in some of the earlier presentations, so um, that's Freedom of Information Act requests. So how does FOIA apply to social media, and how, what do we need to be thinking about as planners to make sure that we're addressing this? So Jane and several others asked about this. Well, this is Beth. Um, I am not an expert on this, and I'm certainly not an attorney, so I just want to preface my, my comments with that. Um, different states have different laws that, that relate to social media and things that need to be, um, I guess you could say, to my understanding, archived. So if someone submits a FOIA request, I'd like to see um, all of the comments that came in for that planning process. Um, that would mean that you would need to, uh, you know, archive those things that you're, you know, receiving through social media. So um, it's really important to, to talk with your counsel and get a sense for what the FOIA laws are and, um, and how to comply with that. It's my understanding from some of the discussions that I've just been in on, on this Twitter chat that I participate in periodically that they vary from state to state. And there's been some changes that some states are, are thinking about in terms of uh, what's FOIAable and what isn't. So I'd encourage you to, to check in. and. Uh, I think that's going to be an emerging area uh, as the technology changes and the law tries to uh, to keep up with that. But Judy, I don't know with your agency is, is that that's probably something that you guys think about uh, a good bit as well. I'd imagine. Yes, we get FOIA requests, and um, and uh, we will not have a meeting that isn't public. Uh, so there was a time when we were thinking in our social media strategy about. Um, uh, having um, some core group meetings and, and making and having them um, meet online in a, a closed section like what um, uh, Beth was talking about, but we really can't do that. That's something that is uh, our agency is 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 totally um, transparent. So uh, we couldn't use social media for put, to put barriers between. Um, uh, discussions. So uh, it, it, we are we are um, we have to be uh, subject to that for you at all times. Our next question: How much staffing is needed? Now, of course, this is highly variable depending on what type of project you're using. But maybe you could give one or two examples from our our panelists who could just share staffing around a particular project. Gosh, I really defer to Judy on that. I think we have a good sense. <laughs> well, um, Judy? The, the project that we're doing right now, the Plan 2040, is a staff of 
um, 30 or 40 people uh, because we have research, we have land use, we have modeling, we have GIS, we have all that. As far as the outreach part of it, um, I'll have to say that all of us have a handle in that, um, a handle on that, a hand in that. Uh, we, we all do parts of it. So I always just tell people it's the whole staff. And, uh, and I enlist them whenever they, they're needed. Um, I am a staff of, of one as far as the, um, the public outreach title, but we have a, a planner who does nothing but environmental justice planning. Uh, she's out there every day with environmental justice um, organizations. And, uh, and then um, we have a lot of just specialty um, things that are done within the, the planning process. So it's not real clear cut, unfortunately. I, this, is, this is Chris. Um, I think also, Judy and Beth, wouldn't you say it's, it's the particular public participation plan that you decide to go with as to how much staff you're going to have to have? So for smaller agencies, if they decide that one piece of using social media, a small piece, is going to help what they're doing, say, with a comprehensive plan or whatever, then they might not need 30 staff people to, say, do a blog or to, uh, you know, do Twitter or whatever. They may not be doing as big a deal, so it would depend on how big their, their plan was or, or what their public participation plan was. And also, it also, I think, depends for some groups on do you hire a consultant to help you with that? to help you at least get it set up and, and, and uh, so forth? Well, I can tell you that when we did the, um, uh, the beginning of the Plan 2040, uh, we had a consultant that helped us with the, uh, some of the, the quick guides that, um, uh, that we wrote to make sure that people knew the different components of the planning process. Um, if, if, as a manager of that uh, outreach effort, I'm responsible for kind of connecting all of the all of the um, the parts of it, and so uh, we have lots of people doing the work. But as far as someone putting together the the way it's going to work and the methodology that we're, that we're going forth, um, you know, it, it's done by very few people. Okay. All right, so we just had a question from John. He says, what's the approximate minimum size of a community to make social media worthwhile? So Judith stated she had 1,400 views um, of an online presentation for a 5 million person region. This ratio would only yield eight views for my community. So what are your thoughts on community size and, and picking the right social media tools based on the audience? Judy. Oh, <laughs> I was thinking Beth could answer that too. No, that is not that many um, uh, responses and views, but if we were to go out uh, with a public meeting, it'll be much less than that. Um, public meetings um, are just very, very difficult and very costly. And it is just one part of what we're doing. So I'm not unhappy with, with 1,300 views. Um, I, I think that it's, it helps is part of the whole, and um, and so I, I think you just have to be very multifaceted and, and do a lot of different things, and it all adds up. This, this, I, this is Chris again. I, I do think, it, and Judy and Beth have both pointed this out, and uh, as, a, con, as a, a consultant working with communities and, and counties over the years, it's very important to know up front what your plan of attack is, and what social media you're going to use and or not use and do your research before you throw yourself into this and so that you don't get to the end of a process and go, oh my gosh, what have we done? I, I agree with that. I think in the points Judy made as well, um, you know, it, it depends on your particular community. If you don't have a, a, a very good way to engage people with disabilities who can't get to the regular meeting, um, but you're able to connect with them using social media, I mean, right there, that's, that's a value added. If, if it's 25 people and they are really adding, you know, important comments that can uh, help you respond to that need, right there, I mean, even though 
the investment of time and effort might be substantial, you're, you're really responding to a particular uh, need in the community that needs to be included. So I think it, it's very um, individual. Uh, I will say there are some ways that you can um, have a domino effect. And what I mean by that is um, my Twitter feed is, this is not complicated to do, even though I'm kind of a gearhead. Um, I, my Twitter feed is hooked up to my Facebook page and my LinkedIn page. So every time I post something to my Twitter account, it automatically shows up on my Facebook page and my LinkedIn page. So I'm only posting that information once. And um, so that means people who, I'm not a huge Facebook user. I have a page, people are there, it's great. Um, but, you know, whatever way people want to connect with me, you know, that way they can keep up with, oh, I posted this or that. So, you know, there are some economies that can also be achieved um, using the technology too. Um, so if, you know, going where people, where it's meaningful for them, if you can find a way to do that and you have a very small staff and limited time, uh, it can be beneficial. And I think you have to start somewhere. Um, we decided that we would um, work with the Facebook page and that would be what we did. And, um, and we would try out the online public meeting. This is the first year we've done it. This last year was the first year we did it. And we just wanted to start doing something. And, uh, and I think that, uh, like Beth was saying, you build on that and people start expecting and it becomes a little bit different later, hopefully. Um, but um, we are trying to, to go into many different types of communities and, and have different ways for people to engage. So it's, it's not a, a huge expenditure of time. And I think um, uh, compared to our public meetings that we had before, it's much better. OK, so one of the next questions is from uh, Jacqueline, and this one's for Beth. What polling tools are you familiar with that use cell phone devices, and is there any low-cost software for cell phone polling? Yeah, there, there, are, there are some good ones. Um, one um, I would direct you to, it's called, it's a terrible name, but it's called Text the Mob. Um, that's a, a, a pretty good one. Um, there are several others out there. I don't have a list, but um, what I can do is uh, here in a, a moment or two, I'll, I'll pull them up and post them in the chat window. That's one. Um, in fact, you know, one of the neat things about kind of the, the crossover between these different platforms, um, we held a, a meeting this was a while ago in Second Life, um, which is a, an alternate world, if you will. It's a, a place where people can, can go and, uh, and meet. For those of you who are familiar with it, it's a virtual world. Um, and we were able to have people in that virtual world text in responses that then appeared on a screen in that virtual world um, in response to polls. So that's one in terms of texting that's really good. Um, I'll, uh, I'll post a couple others. Uh, I just off the top of my head, I, I, I can't recall them. OK, great. So let's see. Um, Next question. Okay, so this is a common one. I, I see this question happen a lot. So Jim wants to know, my staff is prohibited from accessing social media sites by municipal policy. So for example, when we had our hashtag earlier, some people said, you know what, I can't access Twitter from work. So uh, getting beyond that, have you run into this in terms of limited access for staff so the municipality can, remain, uh, can maintain social media sites? What are the uh, words of advice to help get around some of those policies that are limiting access? That's becoming less and less of a problem. It seemed like when it very first started, uh, um, Facebook and Twitter were so um, off limits to to the public agencies that I uh, talked with. But that has become so not a, a problem right now. I, I don't know what kind of advice I could give. Uh, um, the the, the the actual website would be the only place they could really give information out, I suppose. Beth would have a better solution, I would think, for that. Um, yeah, I think, I think 
I agree. It's something that's that's changing. Um, it, a lot of federal agencies now, I, I think, are starting to to really um, realize that they need to allow that access. Um, and my sense of it is around building that business case, saying, you know, we need some other ways to engage people, and um, you know, going out and doing a survey of your stakeholders and asking them, um, uh, and if they would use that tool, um, I think is, is a good place to, to start that conversation to, and to be able to say, you need to please make an exception and find a way to work with your IT people um, to make that possible. Um, that would probably be my, my best suggestion. Our next question is, do you think that social media for public participation creates an unfair bias when gathering feedback on a plan? For example, tech-savvy versus non-tech-savvy stakeholders. Should this be a concern? So that's a question from Mike. I think so. I think that's what I uh, was saying in, in my presentation. I'm very worried about, about that. And one of the reasons is because there are some people who are very, very connected to our planning process. And it's almost like there is a bubble um, around those people and the planning process. And the general public may or may not have that, the connections to get there. And so what the local officials are hearing are, is information from that bubble and not particularly from all the people that are out there. And so um, surveys are OK. Focus groups are great, but everything is very expensive. So um, I think our uh, public officials or public officials throughout would be very um, reticent to, to take as, as gospel the information that they get through a social media site. Uh, this is Chris. I also have an example. Um, my daughter just finished a, an internship with a, a county. And within the staff, I think, there was a problem. There were some people that were really into use of social media and others that didn't really have a clue what they were talking about. So I think you've got some, a, a big learning curve in a lot of planning staff where some really know what's going on and some have no idea. And you can create a real imbalance within your own staff before you can even get out to the public. So there's a, a, a lot of learning to be done. Okay, great. Thank you all very much for your comments. I, I will add as a note that the fastest uh, growing segment of the population that is adopting social media are those age 55 and up. So while I think it's easy for us to be thinking about, you know, uh, not having an older crowd that, that knows what's uh, going on when it comes to social media is accurate for the moment, but is rapidly changing. So folks like yourself are participating in today's webcast and, and learning more about what's going on. Um, I do have a couple of announcements, and I'm going to turn it back over to Chris. So uh, we mentioned today that there's an upcoming uh, co web conference that Beth is hosting on games and apps for mobile phones. And so you can go to her website at publicdecisions.com to learn more about that. Um, a lot of the questions that have come up today, a lot of the topics that have been talked about, uh, I'm writing a planning advisory service report that's going to be coming out in April for those of you that are subscribers or you can purchase it from the APA website that's going to go into detail and give examples and websites and other things to help you learn more about this topic. And as I mentioned, today's session is our introduction to social media. We're doing an advanced session on April 1st. In that particular one, we're going to be going into a lot of detail with a, a deep case study Study, looking at the use of Twitter and some other social media tools and how you can effectively use that to engage new people and some of the pitfalls, you know, you, you all have brought that, the FOIA and some of the other things, and how a particular community has addressed those very detailed level issues. So I hope that you'll choose to join us uh, for that April 1st session. At this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Chris, who has a couple of announcements herself. Chris? Uh, I just wanted to remind everybody, even though we've said this several times, uh, and I think um, Jennifer is providing this information to you uh, after the, our talk is over. Please, we would love for you to join our APA Public Engagement Interest Group. And she's giving you the information on how to join that group. You just go on to www.engmt4sust.ning.com. And don't worry, that's going to be coming through to you all later. 
and uh, then it, it asks uh, the chair and co-chair if you'll accept the person into the group and we uh, accept people. We've only had one ringer, <laughs> so we have about 500 people now and we are really in need of people who want to uh, provide information, uh, give us some ideas about what you think we ought to be doing in our NING group and there it's coming up on your screen. This is what it looks like right now. So we really encourage you to join us and we are also uh, trying to have a little get together uh, at the Boston National APA Conference this spring in April and we'll be providing more information about that uh, on the NING page and probably through some other methods that uh, uh, we will get to you later. But I just wanted to encourage you to please join and thank you so much for coming today. Uh, we really appreciate it and I, I think this webinar whole series that uh, CPC is doing is great in the divisions and uh, universities and I, I really think this is a way for us all to learn a lot more. And I for one am going to sign up for that April 1 webinar. Thank you again. All right. Thanks to our speakers and thanks to our audience. You'll have a survey that will pop up as you're leaving today's session. Please fill that out to provide feedback to our speakers today. And as a reminder, you can log your CM credits today. Just look on the CM calendar and you'll be able to select social uh, media and that will get you your credits. For our speakers, I'll be following up by email about an hour after today's session and get you the feedback from the survey that everyone has uh, completed. So thanks to all of you for joining us and I will follow up by email to Beth, Chris, and Judy. Thanks so much. Thank you.